Okay, and we bang a gavel. Yeah, uh -huh. that's how it starts. starts. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sobel. I'm a reporter with the New York Times and a member of the club. I'll be moderating today. Uh, I'm happy to have as our guest today Patrick Harlan, universally known in Japan as Pakkun. Uh, you may know him from television. He's one of the best known non Japanese celebrities in Japan. He's a native of Colorado, a graduate of Harvard, and he captured audiences' attention initially as the funny man foil in the comedy duo Pakkun Makkun. He's acted in movies and television series including NHK's historical drama depicting the life of Sakamoto Ryoma. He makes regular TV appearances as a news commentator and as the host, most recently, of BS, TBS's Gai Kokujin Kisha wa Mita, which in English they're translating as Through Foreign Journalists' Eyes. Uh, a full disclosure, I've been on that show a couple of times. Uh, he's an adjunct, pro adjunct professor at Tokyo Tech University and, the auth and an author and columnist for Newsweek Online and other publications. Uh, he's a repertoire that spans the silly to the serious, and he's in a unique position to observe and share insights on Japan's news media and the entertainment industry. So we'll hear from him for about half an hour, and as usual, uh, you'll be free to ask questions after that. Uh, shouldn't need to remind you at this point to turn off cell phones and so on, but please do. Uh, and with that, I will turn over the floor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. My name is Patrick Collin. It's a pleasure to be here. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to do something you probably have never done at one of these things, because I may be the first American manzaishi you've ever had here. <laughs> so I'd like to sort of break the rules, break the, the mold, if you don't mind. Can I each ask you all to raise one hand? I'm going to do something that I always do to start my shows. Raise one hand, please. <laughs> what I just did was not just rock, paper, scissors. It was a personality test. Please show me once again what you, what you uh, showed. It was a rock, paper, or scissors. Depending on the sign, we can know what type of person you are. I'm going to do this in Japanese because it's easiest. まずグーの方大きく上げてください。周りあのグーがいの方を下ろしていくください。はい、グー。あ、グーの方。あ、グーですね。はいはいはいはい。さあ、続いて長期を出した人大きく上げてください。お、おいるぜ。外国人記者ク
Not a word we use in English, right? We don't say multi-talent. A talent in English, I think we say personality. And if we said multi-personality, it sounds like we have a disorder. So I don't say multi-personality. I actually use the word marchitarento. What is a multi-talent? Well, it's a person who does a bunch of different things at a very mediocre level. A talent is a word which we use here in Japan generally to refer to, refer to someone without one. A talent is sort of a catch-all. If you're a singer, you're a singer. If you're an actor, you're an actor. If you're a comedian, you're a comedian. If you're a talent, who knows what exactly you are. You're on TV because you basically have a personality, which is probably why in Japanese it's called a personality. So I'm a personality here in Japan. My, uh, my different jobs, I'm a comedian, I'm an actor, I'm a DJ, I'm a narrator, I'm a commentator recently, I'm a columnist, uh, and I'm a teacher. I do anything they pay, to me, pay me to do. And anything, in fact, I'll do anything at all if you pay me to do it. I am getting paid for this, right? Uh, you'll get a one-year membership in the club. Yes! <laughs> so I, I set my bar, bar fairly low. On the other hand, I try to bring everything I can to every job which I get. And so today I'm going to do everything I can to impart, to uh, communicate what I understand to be Japanese showbiz, Japanese communications, and the amalgamation of those two, which is Japanese media and journalism. And of course, the foreigner uh, component to that. So let me tell you how to I got here. I ended up being a multi-talent because I have a wide variety of interests. From the time I was in elementary school through junior high, high school, college, I did sports, I did music, I did uh, academics, of course. I did mock, uh, mock UN, mock trial. I was head of the, uh, the National Honor Society and the Spanish club, chess club, everything. And I had a teacher uh, in college who said, look, Patrick, if you try to do everything, you will end up being able to do nothing well. And I said, hey, good idea. That's where I'm going to go with my life. And I kept doing everything average, or a little bit above average, but nothing particularly well. Thank God I ended up in this position. How did I end up being, doing all these different jobs? There's one key, which I encourage you to pass on to other generations. When you want to do something here in Japan, write it on your business card. Start handing out your business card, and people will ask you to do that job. It's an amazing thing. A friend of mine told me this 20 years ago, and I tried it. I said, DJ, Patrick Harlan. Narrator, Patrick Harlan. Talent, model, actor, Patrick Harlan. <laughs> Wrote it all on my business card, started handing it out. I had never done any of those things professionally before. Pretty soon, the phone starts ringing. They say, you're a DJ, come DJ. They say, you're an actor, you're, come act. They say, you're a comedian, come comedy. <laughs> it was an amazing turn of events. And honestly, I feel bad because I was not prepared for the first 17 years in this job. I'm now in year 18, and I'm finally getting the hang of it. So I ended up doing all these different things fairly well, some better than others. But I survived somehow in a very tricky uh, environment. And I'm honored to be here today. So let me tell you about the one thing which sets me aside, apart from my other Gaijin Tarento friends and adversaries, as it were. Uh, I do humor. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to start by uh, addressing some of the differences between Japanese and American humor. The first is the obvious uh, form of it. There's two people on stage for most Japanese humor, and what, of course, you know is manzai, and often in konto as well. And they play different roles. There's the straight man and the funny guy. Now, we used to have this a long time ago in America. We had many comic duos. There was Laurel and Hardy. There was Abbott and Costello. There was Bush and Cheney. This is the joke. <laughs> but we don't have that much anymore of the two-person stand-up comedy. We have more one-person, more topical comedy in America. 
And I didn't realize that when I came over and started doing comedy. It was much, much harder than I expected. Comedy in a different culture, comedy in a different language, it is perhaps the hardest thing I've ever undertaken. And I'm sure you all know who Toda Natsuko-san is. She's the translator of many, many uh, Hollywood movies. Uh, she's probably the most famous uh, subtitler in Japan. She said to me on a TV show that translating comedy is the hardest thing she's ever asked to do. It's nearly impossible. She said to me, Patrick, you understand, you struggle with comedy every day. Which I thought was kind of an insult, but yes, it's true. I struggle with comedy even today. But I've learned that there are, there are rules, there are patterns, and if you learn the patterns, you can be funny in Japan, or any country probably. Um, the patterns are very different from America, specifically in that in America we have three basic types of comedy, three basic sources of comedy. There's political, there's sexual, and there's redneck. Do you all know what redneck means? Redneck means inakamono. Political, sexual, and inakamono. And tokidoki kiseki ni, sometimes miraculously, they all come together, like during the Bill Clinton administration. <laughs> that was the trifecta, the perfect unity of American humor. But here in Japan, most of those are off limits. You can't tell sexual jokes. You can't really tell political jokes. There are very few com comedians who make a living telling either of those. There are some who do it in small stages, in front of a live audience. But you can't do it on TV. And there are reasons for that that I'll get into later. Another difference is that pol politicians themselves in America are funny. If you can't tell a joke in America, you can't get elected. In fact, a lot of the politicians themselves are jokes. This is another joke. <laughs> For example, Obama was asked, what is your greatest strength? Obama said, my greatest strength is that I am too humble. And my greatest weakness is that I am too awesome. He's a funny man. George Bush is another funny man. Fifteen years ago, he said, the war is over. That was hilarious. I'm still laughing. <laughs> Tough crowd. <laughs> Tough crowd. Anyway, the difference is uh, in American and Japanese humor, we're a big education for me. I learned a lot in school. I learned a lot at Harvard. I learned a lot of information, but I learned more importantly how to use that information, how to uh, transform that information into something new, how to bring my own thinking into the, the process and make it to add something in addition to the information. I also learned, most importantly, how to BS my way through uh, the class when I hadn't done the reading. BS, by the way, for those of you who don't know, stands for bullshit. In English, it's a slang, BS. And just to be clear, it is not what the BS in BS Asahi stands for, or BS, uh, BS TBS. That BS is different. When we are BSing on it, it's just coincidental. Just purely coincidental. purely coincidental. So the education at Harvard was followed by an education here in Japan, learning to tell jokes, learning to uh, ad lib jokes, which is a much, much bigger part of Japanese uh, showbiz. Japanese showbiz is largely reality TV. In America, when we say reality TV, we usually speak, we're usually speaking of shows which depict average citizens doing crazy stuff. Average citizens, they're not really average because they're crazy. They're over the top. They do really insane things which entertains the audience. But they're not professional actors or talents or comedians. That is reality TV by, American, by the American definition. By the Japanese definition, why I call it reality TV is because it's largely unscripted. Most of the, the variety shows you see have an outline. They have key words for transition, transitioning between uh, one segment to another, or uh, to s ask a question to the panel. But the panel's responses are not scripted. And most of the interplay that you see on TV is completely ad-libbed, which is the, 
part of the reason there are many, many famous comedians here in Japan, but most of them are not famous performance comedians. They're famous talk comedians. Talk TV, talk uh, radio is much more important here than it is in America. So that's one big difference between Japanese American showbiz. Another big difference is coaching or rehearsal or uh, direction. I started off as an actor in America. I worked up uh, into, to the semi-pro level. I was paid by, I was not making a career of it in college. Um, but my understanding from the American uh, experience, my experience in America, is that acting is very well coached, extremely well rehearsed in America. We will do, you know, an hour of rehearsal for a 10 minute scene, for example, before the show. Here in Japan, actors are expected to learn their lines when they show up, and then they do a walkthrough, and then they tape it. Generally, most acting is not particularly heavy directed. And I found that frustrating when I first got here, and that I would perform, and the director would say, great. And I'd say, what do you want me to change? He said, hmm, walk faster, or speak slower. It wasn't about the acting, it was about the movement or the expression. I found, I found that very frustrating. There was one direction which I got on a, a TV show which I was doing in the afternoon, a uh, soap, soap drama, as it were, a soap opera. And this was maybe five years after I came to Japan. And I'd been teaching English for a while, but I had a Japanese wife. And uh, I was cast as a foreigner, an American, who had been in Japan five years, had been teaching English, and had a Japanese wife. Basically, I was cast as me. And I did the scene as best as I could. And when I was done, the director came over and said, Patrick-san, motto gaijin poku. Hmm, reality ga nai te yoreta. Reality ga nai te sono mama yatten da kiro to but it's very difficult for me to go to act without direction. But I learned that that's the difference. Before, before you go on air, there's very little direction or rehearsal. After you're off the air, there's a Hans Heikai. That's the big difference. In America, we take notes. The director will take some notes and say, OK, everyone, gather, gather around. We have some notes to do. In Japanese, the same process is called Hans Heikai. Now, Hansei, I'm sure you know, means like regret and repentance. <laughs> it's not just taking notes and fixing the problems. It's feeling bad about it. And this amazed me, because even if we had a great show, we'd still have a Hansei guy. Hansei <laughs> But that's sort of the Japanese mindset coming alive in showbiz. People expect humility, they expect uh, an understanding that they're not perfect and that there are things that they should improve. And they should feel bad for the fact that they've caused meiwaku, problems, to their uh, coworkers and the, the direction staff and the cameramen and the, the lighting. There is this whole feeling of humility in Japanese showbiz, which took me by surprise. I don't think we have humility in, in America. I think, I think it must be a foreign word that we've just sort of adopted because it sounds cool, especially in showbiz. Another, another big difference in showbiz is the power of the agency. In Japan, agencies are very strong, very dominant in the scene, how, how you get cast, who gets cast, what sort of show is produced. The agent is a big part of all of those things. And the agent generally controls the talent. In America, the talent hires an agent hires a publicist, hires a lawyer. Basically, the agent works for the talent, not the other way around. And changing agents is not the end of a career, as it is here. There are very few uh, talent in Japan who work on their own or in a very small agency. Um, they're, you know, the success stories are like tunnel, tonderuzu, or cream shoe. Um, but even these started out in larger agencies and then broke off. The only one that I can think of that's been around for a long time as a comedian is Tetsu Ando Tomo. I, 
個人事務所弱小事務所でここまで生き残ったことが何でだろうですよ<笑> It's an amazing story やっぱり日本語でやった方がいいんじゃないか<笑><笑>まあまあ僕も久しぶりに英語喋ってるからちょっと多少滑るだろうと思ってたんですけど<笑> Tough crowd, tough crowd Anyway,、uh, so these are the big differences in showbiz which it took me a while to learn and a longer、uh, time to master But the other big differences between America and Japan which I now specialize in are the differences you find in communication technique Americans, they grow up debating They grow up discussing from the time you're、uh, an elementary school student or even a kindergarten student. We have show and tell in America. Kids will bring in something from home, show it to the class. This is my dad's watch. I took it off his wrist while he was sleeping. I'm going to sell it at a pawn shop later. You know, kids will do a presentation in front of the class from the time they're four or five years old. And then when they go through school, they're expected to participate in every class, in almost every aspect of every class. In Japan, they might say, Columbus、uh, traveled to America in 1492 looking for a route to the Spice Islands、uh, in the Far East. In America, the teacher might say, Who here knows who Columbus is? And what he did, and when, and why? And the kids have to answer those questions. And even if they get it wrong, the teacher would say,、oh, That's a good answer. I like the way you're thinking. But let's think of、uh, some other reasons and find, see if we can find the right one. It's a much more、uh, give and take, a much more. So, Hoko s a y help me out. Give and take.、Uh, give and take. <laughs> it's, a, it's a two way street. Communication、yeah. in Japan,、uh, in American classrooms, is a two way street. In Japan, it's much more one directional. And that transfers, I think, to showbiz. and The larger population. I'm not saying that Japanese people are bad communicators. I think Japanese people are amazing community, communicators. In fact, from an American perspective, Japanese people seem to have a sixth sense. They can read the air. This is not something we Americans specialize in. Japanese people. Are famous for, say, for not saying no, right? In fact, no to yen ai nihonjin was a catchphrase that was very popular a few years ago. And I used to feel that way. I felt that Japanese people would never say no. It was very confusing. But what I learned is that Japanese people are saying no a lot. It's just that we Americans don't get it. For example, if you take a new project to Uh, one of your clients in a business setting, and you say, and the client says, This means no. <laughs> Or if he says, This also means no. If he says, This means no. <laughs> if he says, This means no. <laughs> They say no all the time. In fact, Japanese people, I've learned, if you say, and they say, this means no. This, this They say no all the time. It's not a problem of communication, it's not the,、uh, transmitter. the transmitter, it's the receiver. Thank you. It's the receiver. We don't have the same Jushinki, Americans, which I think is a big problem for Japan going forth in the international world, in, in the global, global shakai, as they say, in international negotiations for government, for business, for media. I think the Japanese need to learn to speak in American or Less、uh, low, con low context style, as it were, to not assume that your、uh, listener is going to pick up on all the subtle cues which you are sending as a Japanese person. You need to be able to expect that the listener will get 0% of the subtlety and speak as if you come from totally different planets, which is basically, which is basically the case. 
In Japanese, you say, ichi o itte ju o shiru. Say one thing, say one, and expect ten to be understood. But in cross-cultural communication, I think you need to think, say ten and expect one. Ju o itte, ichi o shitte kureleba, ureshii ho desu yo. Sore gorai muzukashi. And I think that this, uh, this difference in communication also comes out in, in the media. Japanese people don't grow up discussing. They don't grow up disp debating. So you see very little serious hardcore d discussion or debate on TV. You see people being nice to each other, which is the trademark of Japanese society. And one of the reasons which I and many other foreigners love it here. It's a very polite society very polite discourse. But the exchange of ideas is not necessarily helped by that uh, politeness. I think you can have a strong debate with politeness. And I think you can also have a strong press corps that can still be polite without being uh, namby-pamby, <laughs> without being weak. I think. I'm sure many of you agree that there has been uh, some frightful developments in Japan regarding freedom of the press. A few years ago, uh, a governor, I won't name names, a governor uh, refused to speak to one of the uh, newspapers here because of an article written, by, written in a magazine affiliated with that newspaper. Recently, Another uh, TV company was brought to task by the governor, uh, by the government, for broadcast content. In America, the government interfering with the story would be the story. The government interfering with the operation of the media would automatically set off an incredible response from all of the media outlets, not just the targeted one, from all. A few years ago, Fox News was uh, demoted in the White House press room. Um, Fox News was on a rant. They'd been uh, broadcasting a lot of misinformation about the government. And the Obama, Obama administration decided to move them from the first row to the second row in the White House press corps, saying the first row is reserved for real news. This caused a huge backlash not just from Fox, but from CNN and NBC and ABC and CBS, all of the news outlets said, no, you can't do that, even to this crazy Fox news outlet. <laughs> even if they're crazy, they have the right to be respected as a press source for a large percent of the population. They have the ratings, they have the, uh, they have the following, they deserve the respect. And I thought, over the last few years that that respect for the power of the press, the freedom of the press, has really declined. I see this sort of as a trend from you know, all of the things I've been speaking about so far, from humor through communication into the media. And I, I would understand if you don't feel like listening to me on this subject, because I'm not a journalist. I'm not a correspondent. I'm not really a newsman. I do that because I'm a multi-talent, I'm a commentator. But I am speaking from an outsider's perspective to the Kisha Club here, to the Foreign Correspondents Club. I feel, for example, that Japanese Kisha Club Seido, the, the Correspondents Club system, needs to be revisited. It needs to be revised. I think it's a hurdle to uh, freedom of the press. And I understand if you have strong feelings about that. But I also appreciate you listening. I think in America, this, the role which I sort of would like, would like to play in Japan. I would like to be sort of the John Stewart of Japan someday. I said that there's no political commentator, uh, commentary in Japanese humor, but that might change if freedom of discourse, freedom of discussion, freedom of the media is increased here in Japan. Um, and I think, especially in America, John Stewart and his uh, compatriots in social commentary comedy play a huge role. You may be aware of this, but there was a college uh, study where they asked people who, people on the street, they did a survey asking people their knowledge of domestic and international news events. 
They asked them 10 questions and ranked the people's scores by where they got their news. The highest rank was people who watched American public, uh, or listened to American public radio, NPR. This scored the highest. They were the most informed of the public, the people who listened to NPR. The second most inform informed group of the public were people who watched John Stewart's comedy, political comedy, real news with funny jokes that lingered and gave you, gave you a good understanding of the impact of the news. So the top was NPR, the second was Jon Stewart, the third was C, uh, CNN, the fourth was no news at all. People who didn't watch the news at all were fourth most informed. Fifth was Fox News. <laughs> it's true. Jon Stewart is playing an important role, or he was, playing an important role in informing the public. I think that that might, might be a role which I might fit into someday. Uh, and so, as soon as this uh, speech time is done, I'd certainly like to get your input on that as well. <clears throat> Tell me if that's a possibility. I think that this uh, environment with the very limited news sources and fairly limited coverage is ripe here in Japanese for an opportunity for new news, for new news outlets, new news approaches, new news commentary, new news uh, opinions. I think the public would like to hear some new news, and I hope that the, in the future we can provide that. Uh, BSTBS's new, new show, Gai Kukujin Kisha may be the start of that trend. We're trying to bring in Gai Kukujin Kisha, Nomiya-san no koi, the voices of foreign correspondents to give the Japanese view, viewing public a new uh, insight into the same news. Uh, one other thing I'd like to touch on before I go is that, or before I finish my speech, is that I think both the Japanese public and the Japanese media are wonderful. I think they're incredible. Really, I wouldn't be anywhere else. I love the Japanese public. It's a little gullible, maybe. It's very sunao, you know. If, if you tell the Japanese viewing public that this is Sandai Nantuka, they believe you. Sandai Ryori tuka. Dare ga kimeta Sandai Ryori da to omonai. But if you say it, people nod. Yes, it is Sandai Ryori. Toruko Ryori, Sandai Ryori no hitotsu. Tabeta koto nai. Who knows? Who decided? It doesn't matter. People believe it. They're a little gullible, but they're extremely nice. And they are extremely demanding of politeness, which keeps the discourse polite, which I appreciate. And also fairly balanced, which I appreciate. American news, even though I've told you some of the good things about it, it's very alarmist. It's, it's terrifying. We have the 24, hours new, 24 hour news cycle, and we are always trying to give our viewers the adrenaline rush that comes with fear and anger. Here in Japan, TV can be very soothing and funny, and laughter produces epinephrine and cortisol, and good things, these, these hormones which, are, uh, which come out when you laugh. It's an internal reaction which makes you feel good. It's wonderful. It's a service that J Japanese TV provides. American TV news provides the same epinephrine with a little adrenaline. It, it makes you afraid and, and angry. And that can be just as addictive. You want more fear, you want more anger. And so American news can be very alarmist. For example, if you took a story here in Japan, uh, three hikers were stung by bees on Mount Fuji. The same news in America would be, da dun dun da dun da dun dun da dun dangerous infestation, da dun da da dun poisonous drones, mount attack. Do you see what I did there? Bees, <laughs> bees, drones, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's very, it's over the top. American news isn't perfect. Japanese news isn't perfect. But I think we can learn from each other. And I think that is where the foreign correspondents have a role to play. Bringing the foreign perspective into Japan. Perhaps exporting the Japanese perspective to the world. And I think now more than ever, we need you. And hopefully, 
in some small way, the Japanese media and entertainment industry needs me as well. Thank you very much. Tough crowd. <laughs> Thanks very much. There's a famous scene in The Shipping News. Have you read that book? Or, or has anyone read The Shipping News or seen them? There's the a film? movie about it, right? Yeah, yeah. the film. Uh, so, man is being introduced to journalism for the first time in a small town in Atlantic Canada. Right. Uh, uh, by, the island, right? by the local new, uh, newspaper editor. He doesn't know anything about journalism, so the newspaper editor takes him for a, a walk along the, uh, the seashore, and he says, well, okay, let's... Look out, look out there, what do you see? He says, well, I, I see some clouds way out there on the horizon. He says, all right, well, as a journalist, how would you write about that? He says, I, he says, I, I have no idea. He's like, he's like, well, how about town menaced by killer storm? Mm. And the guy says, oh, that seems a little exaggerated. And he says, well, no, well, you know, that's, that sells newspapers. He's like, well, but what happens if, uh, if, the, news, if, if the storm doesn't hit? And that, are, are you going to lose credibility? He's like, no, 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 you get a whole new story out of that. Town saved from killer storm. So I, I think maybe that gets to some, uh, some of the, uh, I, wouldn't like to, I don't think all of uh, North American journalism, but at least a certain strain of American mm. journalism that, uh, that, you might, that you might be talking about. Anyway, thanks, thanks very much uh, for uh, taking us on that walkthrough through uh, not just your experience, but the landscape in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, in, in both My entertainment and news media. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to questions uh, and maybe throw in a few of my own. Is there anyone who wants to start us off? Uh, as usual, we'll, we'll take questions from the working press first uh, and our associate members later. Um, all right. Go ahead. Ask me anything. Yeah. Anyone? Anyone? No. Oh. Ah. Oh, you have to walk over there to ask questions? It's good. Give us some exercises. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a sedentary profession. Uh -huh. the Siegfried Needle writing for Austrian newspaper, Der Standard. It's a pleasure. Uh, how do the newspaper or your uh, um, the t TV station you work for, or all this kind of. Uh, uh, um, yeah, your TV station topic. How do how do they the staff for that? Uh, how do they treat you? How do you, do they see you? It's I think it's from uh, from from my experience. It's every time a kind of a uh, ambivalent reaction of from Japanese people to regard foreigners as a higher, um, more uh, superior people or a kind of uh, inferior people. So uh, uh, in this, this way, how do they uh, treat you? How do they, how do you your communication? That's a very good question. Um, and it's one of the things which I think any foreign talent, as well as uh, correspondents uh, or business people or even residents in general, have to deal with. Um, coming into it as a Harvard grad, I expected to be treated as a superior. <laughs> but that's not really the way it works, um, especially because in my industry, in my chosen profession, there is a huge amount of information that I did not possess when I started. And I was a little offended at first when I was treated as an inferior. Um, but I realize now that I was an inferior. I was light years behind the lowest hen in the pecking order. I was way behind anyone else on the set. For example, um, in Japanese TV, like I said, it's a lot of non-scripted conversation. And if someone says, that reminds me of that character in, in Gundam. Gundam no ano tojo jinbutsu ni niteru yo ne te. And then everyone else on the set can say, oh, and they have this whole vocabulary which I do not possess. Even though I have a different set of cultural uh, information, I could not participate in that particular conversation. And that, in my profession, is a skill which is sort of assumed to be commonplace. And if you don't have that, you are a little lower on the totem pole. Now in my profession, after 20, 
some nearly 20 years as a professional in Japanese comedian uh, and Japanese comedian, I am treated much more as an equal. And in fact, I'm treated a lot better than some of my peers that I started out with in 1996. And the reason is that I bring a different set of information. That even now I watch American TV, I read American media, uh, I watch world TV and media. I'm, I have a different set of information, a di different set of values, a different take on things, which allow me to commentate on subjects with a little bit of a different flavor from my competitors. And if your question is how do they treat me as a foreigner, I still go into restaurants and say, you know, Simasano, Kare Omori Day. And people say, What Nihongo Mai is there? It. You know, which I find a little insulting after 22 years. But they're trying to be nice, and I realize that. I don't consider it necessarily to be an inferiority thing. And I still realize that I am still not in the loop completely. So I understand why I'm treated a little bit different. And in fact, I survive and thrive because of some of the special treatment as well. So I have to take it in stride. How do you, do you, do you feel treated in, as an inferior? Oh, as a superior, wow. Not superior. Well, yesterday I went to two um, a bowling guy. Mm -hmm. And they regarded me as a, a kind of, a, I am a long time uh, uh, regular in this mm -hmm. uh, uh, pubs. Uh -huh. But they regarded me as a special. If they treat you special at a bowling guy, they probably want you to pay. <laughs> 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 Do, do you feel like you have fundamentally, though, come up through the same kind of hierarchy, or, or has it been a completely different track from you? And, and one of the, I mean, my much more limited exposure to the Japanese world, you know, TV world, entertainment world, you know, uh, 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 it's always striking to me just how hierarchical and formal it is. I mean, it's, it, I mean, some of the, with the way I see. Uh, um, famous people interacting with each other in Japan makes it, you know, it makes the most uh, stuffy corporation in Japan or government bureaucracy seem like freewheeling hippie enclave. I mean, it's, I mean, it's very, it, I mean, is that your experience and how have you dealt with that? Uh, I mean, it's a follow up basically, but, but have you come through it? Well, that's an interesting question and, and you're right, Jonathan, the, the Japanese entertainment industry is very well structured, very uh, definitive hierarchy. For example, when you go to a TV station and are in your waiting room before a show, the people who are younger, who are junior to you in the showbiz community, are expected to come to your dressing room for the aisats. And you are supposed to go to the people who are senior to you in the pecking order for the aisats. And if you mess up that system, it's a real hassle. So if, even like, I, I appear on plenty, plenty of shows hosted by people who are younger than me in the industry. They're my junior, and I'm expected to go, or they're expected to come to my dressing room, which is w really weird, because they're the host. I'm just the guest. They're in charge. But if I do that, it sort of throws off the balance. Very weird uh, structure from an American perspective. But I have both benefited from it, being a foreigner, in that if I do break the rules, people generally forgive me. That's, hear it all the time. Um, and I take advantage of that. I, I am a, I am kakshin hung. I am a, a willing criminal, as it were. I know what I'm doing. But the, uh, the flip side of that is that they also, you know, don't expect that I will rise at the same pace, I think, as the people who started in the same position. To answer your question more directly, um, I started off with a lot of fellow comedians in 1996, and not many of them are still on the air. So I- Japanese and foreign. Japanese, there are no foreign comedians in, in my era, um, basically. There were a couple who started up three years later, five years later, they disappeared. There are a couple who are on the air now. Um, I wish them the best of luck. Um, but there are, a lot of 
uh, foreigners who sort of disappeared as well. And I think that the reason, there are a couple of reasons which I've survived. Um, one is that I know how to play the game. I figured out the structure, figured out the system. Um, and another is that I am, thank God, not one dimensional. So I do serious shows with a little humor. I do humorous shows with a little serious information or input. Um, I think I've carved a, a niche somehow for myself. I'm not sure I got a leg up necessarily, although the Harvard thing really helps. Harvard really helps. But I think other than that, it's just that I'm a foreigner who does comedy. I'm a comedian who knows a lot about the world. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hello, good to see you again. Nice to see you again. My name is Fujita. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm with the Japanese media. <laughs> Not a problem. I love, my, uh, I love the Japanese media. <laughs> uh, my question or request, or even, is that uh, you know, we have a Japanese audience here mm -hmm. today, but what if you know, we have a foreign audience overseas watching you? Right. How would you appeal? <laughs> How would you appeal the good points of Japanese culture, the good points of the Japanese you know, uh, way mm -hmm. to the rest of the world? Well, that's actually a question which I get a lot, and the Japanese government, Japanese businesses are dealing with this, discussing this every day. It's the most you know, common theme of the globalization era is how does Japan appeal to the world? How does it uh, promote itself to the world? And I think a lot of things are already pretty well taken care of, pretty well known. The fastidiousness, the cleanliness, the manners, the uh, attention to detail, these are all very, very famous. I think what Americans don't know, for example, is that Japan is funny. Japan has a lot of humor. And it's not all just the crazy stuff you see on, uh, not again, Takeshi, reruns of reruns Takeshi, of Joe, Takeshi or Joe, or it's not just that bizarre over the top uh, physical humor. Japan actually has a sense of humor. I don't think most Americans realize that. Um, I think also the Jap Japanese uh, media can bring a lot to the table as far as like uh, variety shows, which are not very common in America. We could probably translate more shows. We could, I think the Japanese government is doing a lot to promote different foods, for example, um, around the world. That's great. Japanese food is a great introduction to Japanese. A lot of people probably have uh, experienced Japanese food and, and have it, an interest in Japan from that. But I think a lot of Japanese media could be better exported. A lot of people around the world watched Oshin, for example. And they thought, I've got to go to this country. Oshin is such a great drama. There are a lot of other dramas which could be exported, a lot of other TV shows which could be exported. Korea is doing a great job exporting their, their popular culture. Japan could work a lot harder on that. My pleasure. Anyone else? Oh, two. Go for it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, sorry, I didn't see George's hand up. That's all right. I think we have time for two more questions. So if you'll uh, if you'll excuse a slight bending of the rules, then we can you can go first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Mitsuya Goto, a long time associate member of this club, now a life member. Um, the question I want to ask is, uh, I t take it that you had uh, liberal arts education at mm -hmm. Harvard and studied Japanese, but wh what brought you to Japan for the first time in 1996, mm -hmm. did you say? Uh, I, for one, majored in speech at Wabash College wow. in Indiana. And when I graduated 55, I was named commencement speaker. Great. I, I did graduate work at Princeton. I, Thank you. I'm always interested in your what you do here. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to have another Ivy Leaguer in the room. Uh, I actually didn't study Japanese at Harvard. I studied uh, comparative religion. 
and I had a friend from junior high school who was coming over on the JET program. The JET program, by the way, is also an awesome way to get Japanese uh, affiliates around the world, so to speak. Uh, I had a friend coming over on the JET program who invited me. When I was a senior in college, he said, yeah, why don't you come join me in Japan? You can teach English, we'll have an adventure. Um, and I said, okay. I told my mom I was going to go to Japan for one year and come home. Sorry, mom. <laughs> Didn't work out that way. Uh, thank you for your interest. By the way, I get that question a lot, which is... Uh, mm -hmm. Probably anybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure everyone, everyone gets that question. I find, it, I find it interesting that Japanese media often asks many of the same questions. Um, that's sort of an obvious one, but another one I get all the time is, Sukina kanji wa nan desu ka? kanji motteru? Do you have a favorite kanji? I've never been asked that. No. It's bizarre. No. Uh, zayu no me to ka ne? <laughs> Do you, people don't have zayu no me? <laughs> Not that I know. But that question, I understand, and I always enjoy answering it, because it's a great story. It's an adventure. I'm still on an, an adventure, and I appreciate the chance to have, add another chapter to it today. It does seem like a lot of Japanese people can't quite understand why anyone would want to come to Japan, which seems crazy to me. Yeah. I mean, so many people want to come to Japan. It's true. Very, yeah. very popular country. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of refugees. Anyway, we have come. a question from, sorry, I didn't see it at the back there. Go for it, George. Uh, Hello, my name is Baumgartner. I'm working for Swiss Television and Radio France, French Public, Ra French Public Radio. And we, uh, um, a former foreign editor of Radio France, which I appreciated greatly, used to, used to tell me, uh, I never listened to our uh, own radio programs. And he said, you know why? I said, no, I don't know why. I say, and he said, oh, it's because I know the people who make the programs. So he, he, he never <laughs> listened to his own radio programs. And I think, uh, regard the question I would like to, to ask you, we have no, no lessons to give to our Japanese colleagues, you know. Um, but when Fukushima accident happened, it took them, what, uh, over a month or two, to officially uh, tell the people that the hearts of uh, three reactors had melted in the hours or the days which had uh, followed the accident. And during that time, Japanese people living abroad in France, in Europe, were receiving from us uh, all sorts of informations which were not released by Japanese media. Mm -hmm. And they were calling back their uh, relatives home to say, do you know this, this element of information? And they didn't know. And there was another uh, element when OM Shinrinkyo was active and when TBS made a deal with, the, uh, with, with, with TBS, you know, in exchange of, uh, they wanted to watch uh, an interview made with a lawyer in Yokohama who disappeared with his wife and his child after a deal was made mm -hmm. with TBS. And they escaped all that kind of stuff. And it was widely reported. And there was, you know, it's same show, same system, same cortisone, as, as uh, you say. And it seems to me uh, the Japanese uh, television world is still very insular. Nothing has changed. Is there a question no, at the end? Yeah, of yeah. No, so no, no, no foreign uh, media uh, murder can so They try to, to come into Japan without any success. So don't you have the impression that it's very insular, and it's maybe through people like yourself, uh, foreign talento, that uh, uh, the Japanese audience get maybe uh, uh, an impression of the outside world, because it's really insular. I agree that uh, it is, insular is a probably good way to s say it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very cozy, it's a familial setting here in Japan. The number of news outlets is limited. Uh, everyone knows everyone, and there are very strong connections between uh, the government, industry, as I said a minute, minute ago, agencies, uh, entertainment agencies, they all have very strong connections to each of the, the news outlets. So there's uh, a shortage of diversity in reporting, I agree. And like I said before, I think that this, uh, this actually provides the chance 
for new news outlets to appear. And even though I realize that this is uh, a long, long standing association of old news media, uh, new news is changing the world in other countries. You know, the Huffington Post, the Daily Beast, these American news media outlets have overtaken their older counterparts as far as uh, influence, I think, except for the New York Times, of course. <laughs> it, but they're offering a strong rivalry, a competition. The and, just get better. I'm sorry? Yeah, that's right. And the competition is making the long-term long media outlets get better. I think Japan needs a little more competition. I work for all the major news media, uh, and I greatly appreciate it, but I think that competition would make them better. And I think if the news, if journalism in Japan would sort of get together and refuse to bow down to government pressure, for example, that a lot of those doors would open, a lot of uh, those restrictions would, would be lifted. Here in Japan, we say jishu kisei, which I'm not even sure I know how to say it in English. Self-censorship, perhaps? But it's very, very common here, just because you don't want to step on the wrong toes. I think if all of the news media, because it's a, such a small, small society, I think this is possible. It's plausible. You could get all of the news media together and say, let's stop doing the jishu kisei thing. Let's agree that there are, uh, there's a line that we can all go to. And if they move that line back as a group, uh, it'd be OK. I don't think that there would be that much of a backlash. I know, Bito Takeshi-san ga iemashita ne. Akashingo, minna de watareba kowakai. That's the same idea. If you all push on that boundary at the same time, kowakunai kana, it wouldn't be that scary. I'd just like to follow up since we have a few more minutes. But could you tell us a little bit, from your perspective in as a, uh, appearing on these on news-related programs and now hosting mm -hmm. one, at least one. Um, just one. Just one? All right. Uh, when these things are being prepared, I mean, is there, do you get a sense that there are taboos? Uh, or do you, do you get a sense, I mean, have you, because it, to me this is a fundamental issue here. We're talking about freedom of the press and whether this is an issue of the government putting pressure on news organizations or whether it's a question of, uh, news organizations uh, self-censoring, and if they are, is it out of genuine fear of some kind of repercussions, or is this just some kind of extension of you know reading the air? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I've genuinely struggled to understand what the real consequences would be for news organizations, uh, you know, who didn't participate and who crossed that uh, red line. I mean, you know, we the media cannot operate in an environment. Uh, where no one ever complains, including the government. I mean, we mm -hmm. put up with complaints from all governments all the time. Uh, and I sometimes wonder, you know, it's a, when you see in the Japanese press or, or when you hear about the LDP sent a politely worded letter to a TV station and, you know, is, uh, we get way worse, mm -hmm. but we just say, oh, thank you very much, and it goes in the round, in the round folder. Right, right. In the bin. I mean, how much of this is really, do you think, uh, uh, about, um, pressure from above and real consequences, and how much of it is actually really the media needs to buck up? Well, um, real consequences from an American perspective are different from real consequences from a Japanese perspective, I think. And I should point out that I've been saying, Japanese wa doda doda, and you know, Japanese people are this and Japanese people are that. And I need to make sure that you all understand that I am bringing my own opinion of this, and I am not Japanese, I can't speak for the Japanese, so if you really need to, to get the Japanese perspective, you should invite a Japanese person. But my impression is that Americans thrive on controversy. We love it. The leading presidential candidate is a big blob of controversy. He's walking controversy. And that's why he's so popular. He's, he is nothing but controversy, as far, as far as I can see. But Americans dig that. Ratings go up, advertising dollars flood in, the station's happy, the candidate's happy, the viewership is happy. That's the way the American system works. Japanese, from my understanding, the Japanese mindset is not the same. And 
I think we need more stimulating debate. I think we need to, more, to offer more options for interpretation of the news. I definitely think we need more information about disasters and uh, governmental misdoings. But I'm not sure that the Japanese system will thrive on controversy in the same way. So when a Japanese TV program, like the ones I'm on, discusses a topic which may be controversial, they will try to present it with limited controversy, let's say. They don't want to get a, a bunch of te telephone calls from you know, aggravated viewers. And this is probably a big difference between American and Japanese media. In Japan, someone calls, people actually answer it. And they actually talk to them for a long time. I made a comment a couple of, uh, actually I wrote a column in Newsweek, which just a little tiny bit controversial maybe. And my agency got a phone call from an aggravated reader. And my agent had to talk to this guy from like, for like half an hour and apologize. For like half an hour. That's half an hour of time that, that, that my agent could have been promoting me. It's a, the polite response is expected from a TV station. So every time you have a staffer answering the phone for half an hour, that's taking that staffer away from doing something else. There's a serious uh, financial and social impact to controversy, which is why I think the stations shy away from it. On the other hand, I think it might be time for the controversy, the, the, the new business model, to be given a chance, to stoke a little controversy, to take the, call, the calls, to start the debate, and see what happens. I'm not sure every, st every station, every show is prepared for that, but it might be time for some to start pushing on that envelope. Hopefully, BSTBS uh, is taking that step with We'll see. Right. Yeah. Uh, we are now. I think that gentleman had one more question. Did all you? Right. Um, all if, you, if, you, if you're willing to stay for a few more minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm from actually TBS, uh, Yamaoka. Great. Yeah, thanks. And I was you about the variety program in Japan. Like, uh, you're uh, showing there a lot of Japanese TV variety show and mm -hmm. for long years. And how do you feel about the transition of the Japanese TV program or atmosphere? Like, uh, for me, it seems like uh, also you said about the Gaikujin Kishawamita is also one of that kind of mm -hmm. like uh, foreigners appear in show, but also these days like uh, foreigners are praising Japan, like uh, Japan Skoi or something is a little bit increasing for me. Like, uh, how do you feel about transition? It's a good question. Program? Yeah. Um, there are, you know, Namika, there are waves in Japanese media. Um, when I decided to, to try my hand on Japanese TV, there are, there are a whole slew of foreign talent. There's uh, Kento, 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 Debu, uh, Kento, Debu, Chuck, Tuka. Uh, there was at least five that were sort of fixtures on Japanese TV. There's really only one who's on TV on a regular basis still remaining out of that group. Um, and I, I joined sort of like at the end tail of that group in the late 90s. And through basically the, two, the 2000s, there, was very few, very, there were very few foreigners on Japanese TV, at least as uh, talent, so to speak. And then it certainly increased over the last five years or so. And our show, through, through foreign journalist eyes, uh, the show I'm on on Nittere, um, where I'm part of the G20, as it were. Um, lots of shows discussing foreigners' perspectives, foreigners' experiences in Japan. It's great. But I think it's just a wave. And I think it's going to die down fairly soon. Um, it is a little strange to me that Japanese uh, media and the Japanese pop populace feels the need to be praised, especially by foreigners. Because like Jonathan said, you know, it's an amazing country. The world knows how amazing Japan is. It's strange that Japan didn't recognize it. And I think that this trend, having foreigners on TV praising Japan, is a little goofy. 
but it's also doing an important service. It's informing the Japanese viewership of the fact that their country is awesome. It's got a lot of problems. There's you know, huge national debt. There's certainly some, uh, there's the shrinking population. There's uh, a lot of, still a lot of uh, discrimination towards women and towards uh, gender. There are a lot of gender issues, a lot of uh, racial issues. But there's no city in the world that works as well as Tokyo. There's no country with over 50 million people that has near the scores on scholastic tests. There is no country with such a long lifespan and such uh, great average health. Are you asked to be nice on these shows? Because uh, my, again, my much more limited experiences, and maybe this is because I'm a journalist, mm -hmm. and that's a, an even a subcategory within the gaijin category. Mm -hmm. They want journalists to act a certain way. But uh, whenever I've been on Japanese TV shows, if anything, the directors or producers are more like, Basically, like, be, be mean. Tell, yeah. us, tell us what's wrong with Japan. And again, and I, I feel like, well, that's not really, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so I wonder if there's, I mean, I think it works both ways. But is that because I'm a journalist and they expect different things from me? Or what, what are you pressured to say, if anything, part of the reason, positive or negative? Part of the reason is that you're probably a journalist. And they want some, you know, real hardcore opinions so that the debate will get started. And part of the reason may be that you're a foreign journalist, so that they expect you to have a little bit more freedom in your expression. Um, and the, the counterpoint to that is that I am a talent. And for a talento, the ichiban no uri wa kokando desu kara. I have to be likable. My likability index falls, and they'll stop inviting me on the show. So I also do a little jishu kisei. Uh, it's, it's a two-way street. I'm self-censoring. I could say a lot of things a little bit more directly, a little more harshly, but I do follow the, the mores of Japanese communication, and I say them with a little tact. Um, there are shows which they ask me to be harsher toward Japan, and there are shows which they ask me to be nicer to Japan. I try to, be, I try to fill both roles. And I think that Japan has lots of things to be both criticized and praised for, so I don't He'll feel particularly guilty for playing both of those roles. And I think, to answer your question more directly, the latter of those two, the criticism, may rise more over the next few years. Who knows? You know, this We Love Japan boom might last till the Olympics, at least. But we'll see. Either way, if, like I said, I'm a, I'm a hired hand. If they pay me to do something that informs the populace of the great things about Japan, I'm happy to. If they want me to point out the things which Japan could work on, I'm happy to do that. Both are really valuable discussions. All right, thanks very much. And we've gone over time. Sorry. So thank, uh, no, thank, thank you for staying uh, and uh, uh, informing us a little longer. Thank you all for staying. Uh, and speaking of your, your payment, uh, as is customary, I'd like to present Patrick with a Honorary one-year membership to the I went eight minutes over. Club. You better give me a couple more months. Oh, uh, right, one year and <laughs> actually about almost exactly one year and a month then. Yes. <laughs> All, right, All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. All right. Can we please uh, give him a hand? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. My pleasure.